Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Monty Python. Hello again. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. At the beginning of chapter 70, we find another hilarious subtitle, which follows 69. Sancho remains profoundly shaken from the pains suffered during his recent martyrdom. He also laments having to sleep in the same room as Don Quixote because he knows his master will want to talk. Sure enough, Don Quixote enters and marvels at the fact that Altisidora died due to his unwillingness to return her love for him. Sancho responds that he cannot understand what Altisidora's love life has to do with his martyrdom. It's as if Cervantes were challenging us to decipher a riddle. What does love have to do with the Inquisition? Recall the cross-cultural roles of Thoraida and Ana Felix. When Don Quixote and Sancho go to sleep, our narrator intrudes to tell us that Fide Amete intrudes in order to tell us how the Duke and Duchess had planned this last adventure. They both went to sleep, and during this time, Fide Amete, the author of this great history, wanted to write out an account for what moved the Duke and Duchess to devise the elaborate edifice of the spectacle just told. This is hilariously absurd. Are we really to believe that the fictional Thidiamete took advantage of the time that our fictional heroes were sleeping in order to write his fiction? In any case, the narrator tells us that Thidiamete tells us that the bachelor Carrasco disguised himself as the Knight of the White Moon and followed Don Quixote's trail to the Ebro, where the Duke informed him that Don Quixote had gone to participate in the chivalric festival at Zaragoza. Not finding Don Quixote in Zaragoza, Carrasco made his way to Barcelona, where he defeated Don Quixote as told previously. Returning to Castilla-La Mancha, Carrasco told the Duke that he had defeated Don Quixote in order to cure him because it was a lamentable thing that an Hidalgo so intelligent as Don Quixote should be insane. Note that like most readers, most critics think that Carrasco is evil. Nevertheless, his attitude accords here with the Erasmian role of Diego de Miranda as a more exemplary Hidalgo. Did you know? We are studying chapter 70 in part two. The most interesting aspect of Thidiamete's long aside is his concluding moral commentary regarding the behavior of characters like Carrasco and the Duke and Duchess. And Thidiamete says more, that in his opinion, the deceivers are as insane as the deceived and that the Duke and Duchess were two fingers from being fools themselves since they put such effort into fooling two fools. This assessment sounds remarkably like that of the angry chaplain in chapter 32 of part two. The next morning, Altisidora visits Don Quixote and Sancho and following the whims of her masters, she continues to play the part of a forsaken lover. She is dressed seductively and curiously leans on a cane, leaning against a cane of fine black ebony. Is this merely a symbol of her recent brush with death? Or is this something racial? Don Quixote reacts to her appearance in his room by withdrawing. In other words, the same way that he did when Doña Rodriguez visited him. Altisidora gets very upset at being rejected by Don Quixote. She even reworks a verse from Garcilaso's first eglog, Oh, harder than marble against my complaints. She says she died and that she was only saved by Sancho. If it had not been because love, taking pity on me, deposited my remedy in the martyrdoms of this good squire, I would still be in the other world. Sancho responds in two ways. First, he again links himself to his ass. Love could well have deposited them in the martyrdoms of my ass, thank you very much. This grounds the Orpheus theme of rescuing Eurydice from hell, a major topic of Garcilaso's lyric, in the idea that it is Sancho's lashes that allow victory over death. Second, the squire asks Altisidora about hell. 
noting that since she committed suicide, she must have gone there. This opens the door to Altisidora's wonderful inset story about her vision of the underworld. Altisidora specifies that she did not technically cross over into hell. If she had, she would not have been able to return. Nevertheless, she says that near the entrance to hell, she saw a group of devils playing a kind of football game. It's surreal and hilarious at the same time. The truth is that I arrived at the gate where about a dozen devils were playing ball, all down to their tights and doublets, with their collars trimmed with borders of Flemish lace and with cuffs of the same material, leaving four fingers of arm exposed so that their hands would seem longer. Notice the same weird attention to fashion that we saw during Sancho's martyrdom. The devils make a more modest Flemish fashion statement. Altisidora adds that nobody ever wins at this game. Everybody was grumbling, everybody was fighting, everybody was cursing one another. Cervantes mocks the difference between Catholics and Protestants. The strangest detail of all, however, is that the devils are playing football with books instead of balls. In another of Cervantes' great meta-literary moments, Altisidora describes how one of the books that the devils destroy turns out to be Avellaneda's continuation of Don Quixote. A dialogue between the devils criticizes Avellaneda's text. Is it so bad, responded the other, it's so bad, replied the first, that if I purposefully undertook to make it worse, I could not. Quixotic mission. According to Altisidora's vision, what are devils playing at the entrance of hell? A, ball with books. B, tennis with oysters. C, letters with leaves. Correct answer, A, ball with books. Altisidora closes by explaining that her love for Don Quixote caused her to remember this scene. Because of having heard the name Don Quixote, whom I so adore and desire. Don Quixote's response both mocks the existence of the metaphysical world and continues the meta-literary game. I am not upset to hear that I walk about as a fantastical body in the darkness of the abyss or even in the light of the world because I am not the one told about in that story. Next, Don Quixote offends Altisidora by reiterating his loyalty to Dulcinea. By the way, this is a major difference between Avellaneda's and Cervantes' novels. Avellaneda has Don Quixote renounce his love for Dulcinea. Cervantes insists this never happens. Altisidora is so angered by this that she goes off script and exposes the illusion of the Duke and Duchess. You think by chance Don defeated and Sir thrashed to bits that I committed suicide on your account? All you saw last night was an illusion, for I'm not the kind of woman to let even the dirt under her fingernail make her suffer, much less die on account of such camel-like nonsense. Sancho seconds her opinion, declaring that the idea that someone should die from lovesickness is absurd. At this point, the singer from the previous night appears and Don Quixote asks him just what Garcilaso's verses have to do with the death of Altisidora. The poet attributes his quotation to poetic license. It's another meta-literary moment. Cervantes allows a character within his novel to challenge his readers to think about why he cites Garcilaso's texts here. That's all for now. Keep reading. The story only gets better in the final chapters. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.